Welcome to the Cloud Library. It is the home of the world's premier collection, one of the world's premier collections of Judaica and Hebraica. We are very pleased you could join us this evening. Our Deputy Director of Libraries, Jeremy Finkman, was not available this evening, but he sends his regrets that he can't be here. And he's with us in spirit and shared some of his remarks with me, which I'm going to share with you now. Um, I am Abigail Bacon, the head of public services and outreach at the Cloud Library. And I'd first like to give a word of thanks to Dr. Chaim and Claire Rasmusser, who helped co-sponsor this event, uh, actually from the proceeds of his latest book, which is Pictures and Reproductions, which is over for sale at the front desk there for $18 each. Again, all proceeds go to help support events like this here in the library. Uh, okay, on to our program. Uh, among the many treasures in the Cloud Library, we may single out the Edward Birnbaum Collection, which was made part of our collection by Adolf Oko a century ago. Birnbaum, who lived from 1855 to 1920, was a cantor in Konigsberg, Germany and he noted authority on Jewish music, especially the surgical and tentorial music, with the goal of producing an authoritative history of Jewish music, which he never succeeded in writing, he amassed an <coughs> immense collection of several thousand manuscripts and innumerable printed volumes of and on music, as well as an impressive collection of Kunkudaica, some of it quite rare from the 16th to 20th centuries, and you can see some examples on exhibit uh, over there on the left section of our exhibit case. It is no stretch to say that not only is his collection one of the largest, finest, and most comprehensive collections of European Jewish music, but also that it is among the most renowned research collections for scholars on the subject. On a personal note, um, over the last several years, we've had several researchers and scholars come here to the library to use the Birnbaum collection, and they'll come for two to three weeks at a time and really immerse themselves in the collection that we have. And what's what takes me back every time is the breadth of the collection. Every scholar that comes here is studying a completely different topic from within the Burndown collection. Sometimes it's how Burndown interrelated with the Christian music scholars at the time. And some people are studying liturgy, and some people are studying just uh, you know notation. It's really just amazing how much is here, and especially for our people on, that we're recording to, we welcome scholars to come visit us at any time. If you are interested in learning more about the Birdman Collection, you can schedule a research visit to come and join us here in the library. Um, and lastly, so what can sometimes get lost in the well-founded ooing and eyeing over this impressiveness of this collection is the music itself. Our hope this evening is to connect you to the collection through the sound of the music it contains. To do this, we are thrilled to introduce Marissa Kerbel, a Chicago-based pianist and teacher a graduate of the College Conservatory of Music from the University of Cincinnati. She now operates a pedagogical studio of her own, where she trains new generations of musicians. Moreover, she also serves as an adjunct faculty member in piano and music theory at the City Colleges of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Marissa to this evening's concert, Burntown on Ivory, a collection of music from the Edward Burntown Collection. Thank you all so much for coming, and those who are going to be watching online, I'm really excited to present this program. I have or grouped the pieces in this program into sets of three or four based on the like liturgical purpose of the music. Some are going to be comparisons of text settings. This first set of music is all what I might call incidental music. It's not set to text. Originally written for organ, the first two pieces are by Paul um, and they are both organ preludes, followed by a tubeless fugue by a composer whose name is Amy Leish. I was not, there's no first name in the database, so I'm not sure what his first name is. Um, but these would all be pieces that you might hear as you were kind of wandering in, preparing for the Friday night service. So I'll play these three kind of in succession. Feel free to applaud in between or not, whatever your comfort. And then I'll kind of guide you through the different sets as we as we go. Thank you. 
songs that would be sung often as a wedding processional. And so I want you guys to kind of think about the different emotions and scenes you might experience in the wedding, right? There's a lot of joy. There's kind of the grandeur and the spectacle. There's also, you know, the intimacy of the couple, maybe kind of a bittersweet moment, you know, parents wanting their children to grow up, take them to the next stage in life. Um, and so you'll hear how the three different composers kind of 
capture those different emotions and maybe what they want to focus on. All of these pieces originally were scored for orchestra. So you might hear some moments of strings. Um, in the second one by Lewandowski, there are some beautiful kind of woodwind and brass moments. And so I've tried to capture those as much as I can in my arrangement. My teacher used to say that Beethoven thought of the piano as a whole orchestra. So I will do my best to be the whole orchestra for the piano, but you'll see what you can hear.
composed by a composer I had never heard of before doing this, from a country that I didn't know had any Jews. It's by John Jacobson, who was a Swedish composer in the 19th century. If any of you know about Swedish Jewish history, I'd love to learn more, because this music feels very idiomatic. These are all pieces from our normal Saturday morning service. Kedusha and Yiluach, all kind of prayers that we know, and the melodies feel vaguely familiar, and then suddenly kind of veer off into these places that are kind of unexpected. So I find them quite fun, and I would love to incorporate them maybe into some of the Saturday morning services that I play, just to give a little bit of variety, kind of keep, keep the congregation on their toes.
feels like six. They're, the composer, Schulzinger, kind of takes us on this journey, and we feel like we're at the end, and then he just starts back up again. Um, and this piece is really an example of the virtuosity of the 19th century Kazan. The, those cantors really had a lot of labor to do, and they were phenomenal, phenomenal musicians who could do incredible things with their voices. There are many sections in here that are quite improvisatory, but in addition to that, it also changes key and meter a bunch of times. They had so much musical prowess that the congregation may not even have been aware of, and our modern cousins also have all of this skill, and you should listen to this music, go back to your home congregation, listen to your cantor, and appreciate how much work goes into becoming such a strong musician and spiritual leader. It is something that I really admire in all of the cantors in my life, that they have this amazing instrument that they can do so many things with, and they also lead the congregation so beautifully. So this is Melech Al Kol Ha'ulam. Oh, and I told someone I was gonna tell you this. When I'm playing with my right hand alone, that would be the cantor's solo. Yes, and in this time, the cantor would have probably been a man, which means he would have sung something in this register. Um, but many of the cantors I admire are women now, so I have taken the cantor's melody as an octave into the kind of female register. <laughs> it also just works better with the accompaniment. I think it will be really beautiful, and you'll still get the same kind of impression. <coughs> Thank you. 
asked me who, when I was going through the question, this was the composer I was most familiar with from my time in Hazamir, the International Jewish Hymn Choir, and also from singing in my own shul choir. You've probably heard a lot of his music, especially from the like High Holy Day Choir, we still have his, an official like belonging to the roof band. A lot of his music. Um, these pieces are two pieces to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the death of Meritus Mendelssohn, um, which I thought was quite interesting because my conductor of Hazamir Philadelphia, when I was a kid, used to say that Lewandowski was the Jewish Mendelssohn. And of course, we know Mendelssohn, the composer, was also Jewish. And his <laughs> grandfather was Moses Mendelssohn, who was a very famous Jewish scholar and philosopher. And although Felix Mendelssohn, the composer, ultimately converted to Christianity, it's not super clear if that was totally for political reasons, especially because he did not change his name, despite the urging of some of his family members that changing his name would help him be more successful because he would be less recognizably Jewish. He kind of held on to that part of his identity. So I thought that was kind of a fun, musical, interesting connection. Um, and despite these pieces being in commemoration of Moses Mendelssohn's death, you'll really hear them as kind of a celebration of his life. is going to be some settings of Kaddish. Um, and I have always found the Kaddish to be kind of a very interesting prayer and kind of phenomenon in that it is both personal and communal. It's both a prayer of mourning and of comfort. And so you hear in these three different settings, the first of which is by the composer who has brought this collection together, together Edward Birnbaum, the way the composers have the different emotions that come along with saying the Kaddish. The communal aspect of the third setting we are going to be hearing by Simon de Rossi is a trio of three singers that I've arranged for piano. Um, some of these are for choir, and so you can hear kind of the way the voices interact and really support one another. And I think what is really valuable in our tradition of mourning is the way that The mourner and particularly the way that you know you can't say Kaddish alone you say Kaddish as a community with a minion so even if you're kind of mourning personally it's the community 
community's responsibility to kind of come together around you, and I think that is really, really special, and I think that's really captured in these songs that we have.
so far, you will recognize this one. Um, this is Sullivan Janssen's setting of Cold Majere, um, and this piece was actually discovered for me by one of my former professors, Dr. Stephen Kahn, who <laughs> is one of those scholars that I go and that has come here and done some work in the Mirabon collection, and I completely missed it when I was going through it. It is also the only piece on this program that was originally written for piano solo, um, and I was talking to a friend about it once, like a week or two ago, and I said, this piece is what the Bruch Col de Dre would be if it was written by a Jew. <laughs> um, so it takes the Col de Dre as well as a couple of other familiar melodies and creates this kind of musical fantasy, um, full of kind of some virtuosic moments, some really small, intimate moments. Um, but this, my mom said, this was her favorite one to hear me practice because she could kind of hum along. You know, this is one that we all know. So please enjoy.
back to where we began. We are back to Paragon. And this is post-play for Friday evening. So we started with some prelude and we're going to do one of that way in. This is your post-lead. The music you might hear as you're leaving a sabbatical, as you're leaving your tour, spiritual journey, and still thinking about the music and the prayer that you heard in service. Thomas for putting this all together. Um, and there are some refreshments over here. Feel free to indulge. If you want to come say hi, I'll be around. And thanks for listening.